Hi, my name is David Fraser. I'm an internet technology and privacy lawyer with the law firm McGinnis Cooper in Halifax, Canada. Today I'm going to be talking about Canadian privacy law, a bit of a primer for non-Canadian lawyers. A large part of my practice is working with lawyers in Europe and Asia and the United States, uh, helping them with their clients uh, who have to deal with issues of Canadian privacy law. And there's some significant differences. In fact, Privacy is very culturally informed, and different societies come to privacy in different sorts of ways. Different societies also have different regulatory environments, and so the way one country will legislate in this area could be very different from others. So I'm going to start with my usual disclaimer. Uh, this is intended to be general information, an overview, and a primer. It shouldn't be treated as legal advice specifically. This is a complicated area of the law, and it's one that is changing regularly, and one that is really primed to change again in a significant way. And so, uh, look at the date on this, and the information may become out of date relatively quickly. If you have a specific legal question uh, that you need advice on in the privacy arena, uh, you really should reach out to a lawyer with experience in this area. Uh, no nothing in this video should be taken as specific legal advice. And everything I'm going to say is my own opinion, my own views. It should not be seen as the views or opinions or positions of my firm uh, or any of its clients. And of course, I'm talking about Canadian privacy law, and so this really only applies to Canada. So what I'm going to talk about is why Canada has so many privacy laws to begin with. Then I'm going to focus specifically on Canada's federal private sector privacy law, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Within that, I'm going to talk about some key concepts that are contained in the legislation, talk about the 10 principles that PIPEDA, the federal privacy law, includes. I'm going to talk about how the legislation is enforced. And then I'm going to finally talk about data breach notification, uh, as it is, exists in the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. So what's the current privacy law landscape in Canada? Well, we have a mosaic of privacy laws, or you could even say we have a mess of privacy laws. We have Canada as a federal country, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But across from coast to coast to coast, uh, pretty well all government activity is subject to one form of privacy law or another. All private businesses operating in Canada are subject to a variety of privacy laws. The healthcare sector is subject to privacy laws in varying ways in different provinces. Uh, and the private sector workplace is really not subject to much regulation other than what's called a federal work undertaking your business within federal jurisdiction, or private sector workplaces in British Columbia, Alberta, and Quebec. So Canada is a federal country. Uh, we have a federal government, and we have provinces, and we have territories. And the Canadian Constitution gives certain jurisdictions, or certain forms of jurisdictions, certain powers. So it's divided between the federal government and the provinces. Uh, the territories are within federal jurisdiction. And so within our Constitution, provinces have exclusive jurisdiction to legislate over what's called property and civil rights. And this generally includes privacy. And so the provincial governments have exclusive jurisdiction over privacy when it's characterized as a matter of property or civil rights. The federal government has jurisdiction over something called general trade and commerce, which is actually less general than you might think it is. And the federal parliament also has jurisdiction over federal works, undertakings, or businesses. Those are telecommunications companies, those are federally chartered banks, airlines, uh, interprovincial works, and, and things like that. So what we end up with is overlapping, or potentially overlapping, jurisdiction for privacy. And in Canada, we don't have federal supremacy, where the existence of a federal law will automatically override a similar or identical provincial law. So we have a situation where the federal government has jurisdiction over certain things, and privacy can be characterized as a matter of regulating the general trade and commerce in Canada, and provinces have jurisdiction over privacy as a matter of property and civil rights. And so the two have to find a way to coexist. It's not that elegant, uh, but generally it works in Canada. 
So the, each provincial and federal government can clearly regulate themselves. There's no doubt about that under the Canadian Constitution. And the provincial public sector also includes what we sometimes call the mush sector. Municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals. And so provincial and federal governments and their crown corporations, for example, and their agencies are subject to federal or provincial public sector privacy laws. Some provinces have specific statutes for the health sector, uh, and I'm not going to get into that too much. Uh, and there is a mechanism that means that uh, the federal government under the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act can cede jurisdiction to the provinces where it comes to uh, where there's substantially similar legislation. And that's the case for many of the health privacy statutes, for example, in Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador. Now what we have in Canada is a bit of a made-in-Canada solution. In the 1990s, the Canadian Standards Association, uh, which sets standards for electrical devices and business processes, uh, did a very broad consultation and came up with what was intended to be a self-regulatory code for privacy in Canada. So that's the Canadian Standards Association model code for the protection of personal information. Now this was adopted in 1996. And it was developed with a wide range of consultations and consensus across a large number of, of industries. And you'll see, if you're experienced in, in the privacy area internationally, you'll see that it has significant kind of overlap uh, and echoes of the OECD guidelines from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Now, the OECD guidelines have eight guidelines. Uh, the CSA model code has ten general principles. And I'm going to go through each of those ten principles and, and talk about how they're implemented uh, within Canada. But first we need to look at the fact that PIPEDA is implemented in a way that reflects the unique constitutional nature of Canada and the constitutional position of regulating privacy in the federal jurisdiction. So what we have is a situation where when the government passed PIPEDA, it put in place a mechanism by which the federal government could cede jurisdiction in any area where a province has implemented a privacy law that has been considered to be substantially similar. And so they implemented it in a phased-in approach to permit provinces to come up with substantially similar legislation. The province of Quebec already had its Private Sector Act when PIPEDA was passed and started to come into effect in 2001. Between 2001 and 2004, uh, British Columbia and Alberta each came up with their own provincial privacy laws. So those three have been declared to be substantially similar. I did mention health privacy laws. So the health privacy laws of Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador were designed to be substantially similar. And they were deemed such so that PIPEDA does not apply in those provinces where the provincial health information statutes do apply. So how was PIPEDA developed? So in the 1990s, when the government of Canada wanted to use the general trade and commerce power to implement a privacy law, rather than reinventing the wheel, coming up with a made in Canada solution from scratch, or looking to what was happening in Europe, the federal government just decided to implement the CSA model code. And so PIPEDA is an unusual statute in that it has two parts, one part related to personal information protection, the second part related to electronic documents. Uh, and what it does is it also appends to the back of the statute the Canadian Standards Association model code for the protection of personal information and says that those organizations that are subject to these rules have to follow the CSA model code. Now there are quite a few exceptions. The legislation has also been updated a couple times. The most significant revamp was with the Digital Privacy Act a number of years ago, which put in place data breach notification requirements that I'm going to talk about during this uh, video, uh, and also implemented an exception to the consent rule related to certain kinds of business transactions. Now, PIPEDA was designed to be adequate for the purposes of the European Data Protection Directive for cross-border data transfers out of Europe. 
And it's likely that Pipeta is going to have a significant overhaul or even be completely replaced in the coming years. The government did introduce legislation in order to do that with uh, something called Bill C-11, uh, which did not proceed in Parliament, but is likely to be reintroduced in one form or another in the next year. So we have these provincial privacy laws that are adequate or are substantially similar to the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Uh, they're very similar in a whole bunch of ways, but they're not identical. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about PIPEDA, uh, and but some details may differ within those three provinces. A key concept that one needs to understand in order to understand PIPEDA and how it works is the concept of commercial activity. You'll recall that PIPEDA is based on the general trade and commerce power that the federal government has driven over within the Canadian Constitution. And PIPEDA was designed to go as far as federal jurisdiction would permit it to do. So PIPEDA applies to the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information in the course of commercial activity. It also applies to workplaces and employee personal information in federal works undertakings and businesses. So those are the kinds of enterprises that are within exclusive federal jurisdiction. We also have to talk about a key concept called personal information. The statute is all about personal information. If you're not talking about personal information, this statute does not regulate it. And personal information, in short, means any information about an identifiable individual excluding certain business contact information when that business contact information is used to contact an individual in their business role. But it's a very broad definition, so it's any information related to an identifiable individual. So if you can identify the individual from that information, it is going to be personal information. If it's reasonable that you could identify an individual from that information, or you could correlate that information to an individual, it will be considered to be personal information. And so that clearly includes somebody's name, their address, their income, health information, demographics, social insurance number, uh, their image, their photograph, biometrics, and things like that. So it's quite a broad definition. If information is adequately anonymized, so there's no reasonable possibility of connecting it to an individual, then it would be out of scope of the legislation and the law would not apply to it. Now, an important thing, and this it mainly comes up with uh, dealing with American companies and American lawyers, is that whether information is personal information and therefore subject to regulation, doesn't matter whether it's private information, doesn't matter whether that information is publicly known or publicly shared, it really has nothing to do with your expectation of privacy in that information. If it is information about an identifiable individual, it is in scope the legislation. There may be some consent exceptions related to publicly available information, but those actually seldom come into play. PIPEDA also has a baseline reasonableness requirement. So an organization can only collect, use, or disclose personal information for purposes that a reasonable person would consider are appropriate in the circumstances. And so this provision was seldom used until the recent privacy commissioner came into office uh, and has been looking at whether or not the purposes for which certain businesses collect user disclose personal information are reasonable. And if the, if the purposes are not reasonable, it does not matter whether you have the individual's consent. This is an, an absolute kind of guardrail sort of, uh, sort of provision. Now, of course, what is reasonable in the circumstances uh, could differ significantly from one person's point of view to another. Uh, but this has to be understood as a baseline principle. So we have the Canadian Standards Association model code for the protection of personal information. And so it was designed to be a made in Canada solution for the private sector, and it's one that, that got a lot of consensus built around it. Uh, there was a, a, a good set of principles that was flexible, and it could be implemented in a number of different, uh, different areas.
And because Quebec already had a privacy law, so it's not based on PIPEDA or designed to be substantially similar, it's not based on the CSA model code, but PIPEDA is, and the privacy laws of British Columbia and Alberta are based on the CSA model code, although that statutes or those statutes are set out in a very different sort of manner, so the CSA model code is not just kind of slapped onto the back uh, and told to follow it. It, it. The Alberta and British Columbia statutes read a whole lot more like regular laws. Now, all 10 principles can be found to greater or lesser degrees in all privacy laws in Canada. Uh, also in the Privacy Act, which regulates the federal government and its regulations. So the CSA Model Code has 10 principles. And I'm going to walk through all 10 and talk about how they are implemented uh, within the Canadian framework, within PIPEDA. The first principle is called accountability. And this says an organization is responsible for personal information under its control and has to designate an individual or individuals who are accountable for the organization's compliance with the 10 principles of the CSA model code. That doesn't mean that that individual or those individuals are personally liable, but what it means is that an organization has to appoint a privacy officer. There has to be somebody or a group of somebodies who are responsible within the organization for making sure that these rules are followed. So there's internal accountability. That person is not legally liable, but they're probably the uh, outward facing perspective on privacy. The spokesperson for the organization, the liaison for customers, and the person who deals with our federal privacy commissioner if necessary. What it also means is that the organization remains accountable for personal information that it has collected, used, or disclosed, even if it transfers that information to another party to handle it on its behalf. And so this is similar to the notion of controllers and processors in Europe. It doesn't use the exact same language, but the, the principle is applicable. If you are the organization that is facing the customer and you have collected personal information from that customer, and then you give it to a contractor to manage on your behalf, the first organization remains legally responsible for it and has to make sure that there's contracts in place with their contractors so that the contractors will handle it only on their behalf. Now this is an important distinction between a transfer and a disclosure. An organization can transfer data, uh, personal information to a contractor without consent where the contractor is only going to use it as a processor on behalf of the original organization. If it's disclosed to another organization uh, so that the other organization is going to use it for its own purposes, then that is a disclosure in law and that requires consent. The second principle is called identifying purposes. And this is a key principle in the legislation. The CSA model code says the purposes for which personal information is collected shall be identified by the organization at or before the time the information is collected. And it really should be noted that privacy policies seldom satisfy this requirement. Because the purposes have to be identified to the individual at or before the time the information is collected, just having a privacy policy on your website does not provide any assurance that the customer or the individual has read, understands, or knows what those purposes are. One exception may be on, for example, account creation, where a customer or an individual is required to leaf through the privacy statement uh, prior to creating an account and clicks, I agree. So what this means in practice is that every organization has to document internally what are all the purposes for which they collect, use, or disclose personal information. Those documented purposes have to be communicated to the individual at or before the time the personal information is collected. Now that can be done orally or it can be done in writing, but the important thing is that it has to be done. And employees who collect personal information on behalf of a company need to be able to explain the purposes to individuals. This information needs to be provided in a manner that you can have some reasonable confidence that they understand what those purposes are. They understand what it is that they're agreeing to. Because principle two is linked very closely with principle three. Principle three is the consent principle. 
And this says, the knowledge and consent of the individual are required for the collection, use, or disclosure of personal information. And then it says, except where inappropriate. Now notice that I've struck that out. Except where inappropriate no longer applies. The only exceptions to the consent rule are contained in the statute itself, in section 7 of the statute. And organizations don't get to choose whether or not it's appropriate or inappropriate to seek consent. Consent is the only basis upon which personal information is collected, used, or disclosed unless those exceptions apply. And those exceptions are significant outliers. So unlike in Europe, where there are other grounds for processing personal information in the private sector, consent is the principle that is at play in Canada. And so this requires informed consent, which is why principle two, identifying purposes, is so important. The individual has to be told at or before the time the information is collected and at or before the time consent is obtained, what the purposes are for the collection use or disclosure of personal information. And this has to be done in an intelligible way, as I said, so that the customer or individual understands it. And the form of the consent is going to be dependent upon the sensitivity of the information. So the more sensitive the information, the greater the burden of consent. And so this legislation is not particularly prescriptive. So you can have opt-out consent uh, where the information is really not sensitive at all. Opt-in consent would be preferred in most cases. If you're dealing with sensitive information, health information, information about somebody's intimate life or family life or things like that, you would want to make sure that they expressly agree that their information can be collected, used, or disclosed for that purpose. And I would also suggest documenting that consent. So you have a record of what purposes were identified to the individual that they agreed to uh, and at what particular time. You also cannot require that an individual consent to a collection, use, or disclosure of personal information that's not necessary uh, to fulfill the explicitly stated and legitimate purposes. You should also be thinking about the reasonable expectations of the individual. In some cases, the purposes for which information is being collected might be extremely obvious. So you don't need to make Herculean efforts to identify those purposes to the individual uh, or where their consent can easily be implied by them providing the information for those purposes uh, or for proceeding with the transaction, for example. Individuals can withdraw consent. This is similar to the right of erasure, but not identical in Europe. So an individual can withdraw consent at any time, but the organization has the obligation of telling the individual what are the consequences of that withdrawal of consent. For example, the organization might not be able to provide services to the individual if the individual does not consent to the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information that's necessary for the provision of those services. And the consent of an individual is only valid if it's reasonable to expect that the individual would understand the nature, purposes, and consequences of the collection, use, or disclosure of the personal information to which they're consenting. So it highlights the importance to make it clear to the importance of clear to the individual what those purposes are, and having confidence that the individual does in fact understand what those purposes are. Principle four is pretty closely aligned with principle five, and both of them link back to principle two of identifying the purposes. So principle four says, the collection of personal information shall be limited by that which is necessary for the purposes identified by the organization. So you can only collect information that's reasonably necessary for the purposes that you've identified. You cannot collect any more personal information if it's not reasonably necessary for those purposes. And information shall be collected by fair and lawful means. So no use of deceit or trickery or, or anything else like that. So you can only collect information that's necessary. And then principle five leads us to, you can only use personal information, disclose personal information for the purposes that have been identified. So, so much of this comes back to clearly identifying the purposes to the individual. And those purposes create significant guardrails around that information. That information cannot be used for any other purpose 
unless you go back to the individual, you identify the new purposes and you get new consent for that. There's also a requirement to limit the retention of personal information. Personal information shall only be retained as long as is necessary for the fulfillment of those purposes. So the organization needs to clearly document what are the purposes. They need to make sure that the information is only used for those purposes uh, and for no other purpose. They need to have a document retention plan. And so information that gets out of date or that's no longer necessary for the purposes that are identified, that information has to be destroyed. It can be destroyed or made anonymous. If it's made anonymous, then it's no longer personal information and no longer subject to the legislation. Principle six is the accuracy principle. And this is personal information shall be as accurate, complete, and up-to-date as is necessary for the purposes for which it is to be used. And so again, it ties back to the purposes that have been identified to the individual. Now, it's really only an issue when information, personal information, is going to be used to make a decision about somebody. And so an organization needs to make sure that the information is as accurate as it needs to be for those purposes, probably taking into account what are the consequences of that decision to the individual. But information should not routinely be updated kind of just because. Um, information that, uh, for example, you don't want it or don't need to go back to a customer to have their information updated if it no longer needs to be accurate for the purposes for which it was collected in the first place. Um, but also, if it's no longer necessary for those purposes, you probably shouldn't be retaining it at all. Principle seven is a key principle. It's entitled Safeguards. Personal information shall be protected by security safeguards appropriate to the sensitivity of the information. And it goes on to say that personal information must be protected from many threats. Loss, theft, unauthorized access, unauthorized disclosure, copying, use, modification. And this obligation exists regardless of the format in which it is held. Now you'll note that this is principles based. This requires an organization to use safeguards that are reasonable and appropriate in light of the sensitivity of the information. So we don't have prescriptive rules that say this sort of information must be encrypted or this sort of information must be kept under lock and key. Uh, this is designed to be technologically neutral and so that it would survive over time. So this was written in the late 1990s, became law in 2001. And so what is reasonable now and what are reasonable safeguards now would differ substantially from what would be reasonable safeguards in 2001. So it's intended to be flexible and fluid. What I generally tell my clients is you need to implement at least the state of the art of security safeguards that are prevalent in your industry, not just in Canada, but also look internationally. And you also want to make sure that uh, you're doing maybe one better than that. This doesn't require a standard of perfection. The safeguards need to be reasonable and appropriate. And certainly there's an understanding that you could spend a million dollars to protect a hundred dollars worth of information. Uh, and as information technology systems get more complicated, safeguarding that information gets more complicated and more difficult. Principle eight is called openness. <clears throat> an organization shall make readily available to individuals specific information about its policies and practices related to its management of personal information. So this essentially means the organization has to have a privacy policy. The privacy policy is not about identifying the purposes in order to get consent. The privacy policy is in order for the organization to be transparent. That privacy policy has to have contact information for the privacy officer. It doesn't have to name them, but has to have the contact information. It has to tell the individual how they can exercise their access rights. It has to educate the individual with a general account of what personal information the organization routinely collects, uses, and discloses, and how it is used. This can be done through brochures or through the website or other things like that. Uh, and the organization also has to let the consumer know what personal information is made available to related organizations. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada has also said the privacy statement or the privacy policy should include information about what personal information may be stored outside of Canada, transferred outside of Canada, or accessed from outside of Canada. Uh, that is not in the statute, but that certainly is a best practice. Principle nine is individual access. 
So upon request, an individual shall be informed of the existence, use, and disclosure of his or her personal information and shall be given access to that information. In that process, an individual shall be able to challenge the accuracy and completeness of the information and have it amended as appropriate. So this is a data subject access right. The organization has to respond within 30 days. And the organization needs to let the individual know to whom their information may have been disclosed. So organizations effectively have to keep a record of how they use personal information and to whom it's been disclosed. It should be at minimal or at no charge. And the information provided needs to be comprehensible to the individual. So abbreviations and technical terms may need to be explained. There are some limitations and some exceptions to this access right. It's relatively broad. Um, what is interesting is that this right is not exercised as often as you think it might be in Canada. The final principle is called challenging compliance. And so this says an individual shall be able to address a challenge concerning compliance with the above principles to the designated individual or individuals who are accountable for the organization's compliance. Now, this is just common sense. The organization will want to hear complaints first before the individual goes to the privacy regulator. We'll probably want to have an opportunity to address them and to fix them before an individual chooses a more formal uh, path of recourse. And must have a method to receive complaints, address them properly, need to let the individual know that they have a right to complain to the appropriate authority. So now I'm going to talk about enforcement powers under Canadian privacy laws. In Canada, at least under the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, privacy is regulated by the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, or the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, sometimes referred to as the OPC. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada is an ombudsman. The Commissioner doesn't have the ability to levy fines or issue orders. Only the Federal Court of Canada can issue orders or award damages. What the Commissioner does is the Commissioner deals with complaints, first and foremost. Any individual can send a written complaint to the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. The Commissioner can also initiate complaints of his own accord. And what happens next is the Commissioner investigates the complaint. Uh, and there's minimal involvement on the part of the complainant in most cases. The complainant sends in the complaint, the Commissioner investigates, and then ultimately what the Commissioner does in the course of the investigation is really determined by the nature of the investigation. During that investigation, the Commissioner has very strong powers. So for example, the Commissioner can compel evidence, can issue essentially subpoenas, can administer oaths, accept evidence under oath, can also accept and review evidence that ordinarily would not be admissible in court. The Commissioner can also enter any premises other than a dwelling and review any documents in there. Although so far we've never had any dawn raids by the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, I don't think that any of these particularly kind of intrusive powers have ever been used. It's always been my experience uh, in speaking for myself and speaking with colleagues uh, that those who are subject of the complaint tend to cooperate, at least in the course of the investigation. Now, the end product of that is a report. It's called a report of findings. The Commissioner has to issue a report of findings with respect to an investigation within one year from the day the complaint is filed. Now, in my experience, that's seldom the case. Uh, they usually take more than a year, but that may reflect the complexity of, of cases that I generally deal with. And what a finding is, and that report contains what the Commissioner found, essentially. So here is what the person complained about, here is what I investigated, here is what I found. Uh, it will of, often include recommendations, and those recommendations will generally be communicated to the organization in the course of the investigation. So the organization can implement those prior to the conclusion of the investigation. Now the Commissioner can decline to issue a report if there's other recourse available to the individual, uh, but that's rarely used in my experience. Uh, and naming and shaming in, in connection with these reports is a significant incentive for businesses to cooperate even though there are no order-making powers and no ability for the Commissioner to issue, issue penalties.
some of the publish some of the findings are published, not all. Uh, and for high-profile investigations, particularly those involving large American tech companies, uh, there tends to be a lot of fanfare that goes along with the issuance of a report of findings, including press conferences and things like that. Uh, many organizations do not want to be the subject of naming and shaming like this, uh, so will do what they can uh, to be compliant, of course, uh, and to be cooperative and ultimately resolve the complaint to the satisfaction of the complainant and the commissioner. So those findings will fit into a number of categories. Not well founded, which means that the complaint was not made out. The commissioner did not find any violations of Canadian privacy laws. Not well founded and resolved, meaning that ultimately there was an issue, but it was resolved in the course of the investigation. Well founded and conditionally resolved. So. Uh, the organization has been asked to report back with changes that it has made over a medium term or a longer term, and well-founded and unresolved. And those are relatively rare. Organizations tend to want to resolve the matter uh, during the investigation stage. Uh, and if it's unresolved, then the commissioner can, in fact, take the organization to court, or the complainant can. So court hearings. Uh, are, are essentially kind of where the enforcement rubber hits the road. Uh, some people suggest that the commissioner's lack of an ability to issue fines or issue orders uh, is a bug with the legislation, and the, the, the process of going to court is somewhat cumbersome. I tend to think it's more of a feature that uh, when it comes to uh, these sorts of measures, it's best reserved to a court, particularly where they uh, really resolve with uh, the interpretation of the statute. So in these court hearings, a complainant, but not the organization, uh, can start an application in our federal court uh, for a hearing. And it is notable that the organization, for example, if they have been subject to a finding that is adverse to them, uh, they don't have any automatic ability to take the commissioner to court to have the thing reviewed or appealed or overturned. In fact, what happens in court is not an appeal at all. It's what's called a de novo proceeding. So the court starts from scratch. The commissioner might be a party uh, with the cooperation of the complainant. Uh, it may in fact be the commissioner who's carrying the bag on all of it uh, in going to court. But it's not a review of the commissioner's finding. Uh, they start from scratch. And it's, this can only be done once the report from the privacy commissioner has been finalized and delivered. Uh, there is a way to get into court in the course of an investigation on something called a judicial review if there are jurisdictional issues or other things that, that might <clears throat> need to be considered by the court, but generally it's only after the report of findings is issued. Perhaps not surprisingly, the court has pretty broad remedial powers. That's what courts do. So specifically in the statute, the courts are empowered to order the organization to correct their practices in order to comply with the provisions of the Act can also require the organization to publish a notice of actions that they have taken in order to correct their practices. So I guess a double naming and shaming. Uh, and finally, the court can award damages, including damages for humiliation that the complainant might have suffered. It should be noted that there is no mechanism through PIPEDA for a class action to be brought uh, within this process. You have an individual complainant, you have the privacy commissioner, and you have a case before a judge. Uh, so you would not have a class action. Although theoretically, I suppose you could have multiple complainants, uh, but so far we haven't seen that happen in our Canadian courts. The commissioner also has the power to audit organizations. And the commissioner can initiate one of these if on reasonable grounds, the commissioner believes the organization is contravening a provision of Division I or Schedule I of the Act. And during the course of an audit, the commissioner has pretty well the same powers that the commissioner has in investigation, take evidence, enforce attendance, of a, uh, has the powers of a superior court of record, uh, enter any premises other than a dwelling house, examine any records or extracts of records. Uh, to my knowledge, the Federal Privacy Commissioner of Canada has not initiated any audits of any private businesses. Uh, the commissioner has, at least on one occasion, requested that the organization uh, obtain a third-party audit and provide the report of that audit uh, to the commissioner. But the commissioner would not be able to order that. Uh, 
And as I understand, the commissioner doesn't feel that their office has sufficient resources in order to go about auditing organizations. One thing that they have asked for is a power to order audits of organizations and their information handling practices. So the key club that the commissioner actually has is this power of publicity. Because within the Act, the Commissioner is specifically empowered to make public any information related to the personal information management practices of an organization if the Commissioner considers that it's in the public interest to do so. And organizations should be aware that anything the Commissioner says, as long as it's done in good faith, is privileged for the purposes of the law related to libel or slander. Again, as long as it's said in good faith. So one thing that Canadian privacy lawyers are often brought in on when it comes to dealing with and assisting non-Canadian privacy lawyers is providing advice in connection with a data breach that might involve information related to residents of Canada. Now, within our mosaic of privacy laws, we have health privacy laws that have their own peculiarities with respect to data breach notification. I'm not going to talk about those in, in this particular presentation. But what I will talk about is in the general privacy laws. So we have uh, the provincial legislation in Alberta. We have the federal legislation, PIPEDA. Those are currently the two statutes that require private sector organizations to report to the commissioner data breaches and to notify affected individuals. Alberta was the first private sector privacy law to have data breach notification in Canada. And one thing that's notable is the Information Privacy Commissioner of Alberta publishes her decisions on her website with respect to data breach notification. So that's a very useful resource uh, for lawyers who are looking for uh, information and precedents related to this sort of question. So our data breach notification requirements in PIPEDA are relatively new. So these were added in or became effective in 2018 as a result of amendments to PIPEDA contained in the Digital Privacy Act. So there's data breach reporting to the commissioner, data breach notification to the affected individuals, and a record keeping requirement embedded in these amendments. It should also be noted that there may be a common law duty to notify affected individuals uh, if their personal information has been compromised in a way that could affect them, particularly if giving them notice and warning would give them an opportunity to mitigate harm that could happen to them. But we're going to focus on the statutory requirements. As with any data breach law, you always have to be very careful about the definition of what is a breach. So what triggers this whole process? And in PIPEDA, in the amendments under the Digital Privacy Act, that says a breach of security safeguards means the loss of unauthorized access to or unauthorized disclosure of personal information resulting from a breach of an organization's security safeguards that are referred to in Clause 4.7 of Schedule 1, so that's Principle 7, or from a failure to establish those safeguards. And the reporting obligations become triggered if there is a breach of security safeguards where it is reasonable in the circumstances to believe that the breach creates a real risk of significant harm to an individual. This particular provision talks about the personal information being under the control of an organization. So this says to me that the obligation to report to the commissioner is only on the part of a data controller, not a data pro a data processor should have, in any contract you have with them, with the controller, that the processor will notify the controller so that the controller can report any data breach that they have to to the Privacy Commissioner and so that they can notify affected individuals. Subsection 2 talks about what has to be in the report, and I'll get into that in just a moment. And Subsection 3 uh, talks about notification to affected individuals. Again, the trigger is if it is reasonable in the circumstances to believe that the breach creates a real risk of significant harm. So it's the exact same threshold for reporting to the Privacy Commissioner and notification to the affected individuals. So the notice obligations say you shall notify an individual if, as I said, it's reasonable in the circumstances to believe that the breach of security safeguards 
creates a real risk of significant harm to an individual. Now, the definition of what is a breach refers back to principle seven, safeguards. And so what this principle requires is that an organization implement reasonable security safeguards to protect against a list of risks <coughs> that is appropriate and commensurate with the sensitivity of the information at issue. So it's not unduly prescriptive. It's what's reasonable in the circumstances. And again, this comes back to the concept of sensitivity. So we don't have strictly defined categories of what is sensitive personal data. Personal information can be more sensitive or it could be less sensitive depending upon the circumstances, depending upon the context in which the information is collected. Uh, we do have some helpful guidance or wording in the CSA model code to help kind of determine what information is more sensitive or less sensitive. Certainly information about somebody's private life, their intimate life, their family life, uh, information about their uh, race, ethnicity, religion, those sorts of things, uh, financial information, health information, would all be considered to be at the more sensitive end of the spectrum. But somebody's name can be less sensitive or more sensitive depending upon the circumstances. So if your name appears on a list of people who uh, attended a hockey game, for example, that's not particularly sensitive. If your name appears on a list of people who are uh, have upcoming appointments with a psychiatrist, that would be sensitive information because the context in which that information appears tells you information about that person's private mental life, their, uh, their health conditions, or uh, things like that. So the triggers of notification and reporting relate to real risk of significant harm. And so generally that's seen as being a two-part test. You look at the real risk, and then you look at the possible significant harm. And real risk depends upon the sensitivity of the personal information involved and the probability that the personal information has been, is being, or will be misused. And there may also be other prescribed factors, but we haven't seen them uh, appear in the legislation. So you're looking at what's the likelihood that mischief will take place? What are the circumstances in which the breach took place? So if you're talking about a lost hard drive, for example, there's no information to suggest that it was stolen by a bad guy, it was just misplaced. So you don't have a strong sense that mischief is necessarily afoot. But if somebody breaks into your network and exfiltrates information, you already know that there's a bad guy involved, or a threat actor, as folks like to say, uh, and which increases the risk that bad things are likely to happen, or bad things are certainly more likely to happen in a scenario like that. The second part of the analysis is significant harm, and that requires you to take a look at, well, what could go wrong? <laughs> what could this information be used for? How could this information be abused? And the legislation specifically talks about certain kinds of harm being significant. Bodily harm, humiliation, damage to reputation or relationships, loss of employment, business, or professional opportunities, financial loss, identity theft, negative effects on the person's credit record and damage to her loss of property. So it ties pretty closely to the concept of, of sensitivity. And it should be noted, you know, in some jurisdictions, data breach notification really is connected to the risk of identity theft or fraud. And the significant harms that are at play and have to be considered in Canadian privacy legislation are much broader than that. <clears throat> Relate to kind of the, the softer elements uh, of, uh, of privacy and personal life. So when you issue a report to the commissioner, uh, the legislation talks about what has to be contained in that report, and not surprisingly, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada has a form uh, on his website that uh, contains this information to fill out and, and report. Uh, they generally want to know what, who was the organization, what was the nature of the information, what was the circumstances of the breach, when was it discovered, how many people are affected, what steps have you done to mitigate, to stop the breach, and to mitigate the risk of harm, uh, and who is able to uh, be a point of contact for the Privacy Commissioner. The Commissioner can initiate an investigation, um, but uh, most of these are just received with thanks, and that's largely the end of it. The notice to individuals, the requirements are set out in there and are generally quite similar to the information that has to be provided to the commissioner. Uh, although the organization is also required to tell the individual if there's steps that that individual could take to mitigate any harm. <clears throat> 
to themselves. And so it set out, as I said, it's really quite similar to what information is required to be in the report to the commissioner. Now, one thing that's also notable, so the third part, so the data breach requirements under PIPEDA include reporting to the commissioner, notification to affected individuals, but there's also a record keeping requirement. And this says, regardless of whether or not there's a real risk of significant harm to the individual, every organization must create a record related to every breach of security safeguards, regardless of how trivial. And that record has to contain essentially the same sort of information that you would include in a report to the commissioner, but it should also include information to substantiate the conclusion that there was not a real risk of significant harm to the affected individuals so that no report was required. These reports have to be kept by the organization for two years and they have to be provided to the Privacy Commissioner of Canada on request. So this does create a, a discoverable paper trail in the event of litigation. Uh, it should also be known that the Privacy Commissioner has in fact uh, on his own accord conducted surveys of organizations requiring them to provide to his office and his investigators all of these records uh, in order to make sure that they are being created and maintained appropriately. This is one area <clears throat> uh, simply because of, of the risk of discoverability in connection with litigation that an organization wants to be pretty careful about what how they maintain these records. Uh, do they contain information that is privileged uh, because that could amount to a waiver of privilege. It really does take some care and deliberation to set about designing a program that satisfies the record keeping requirements without creating undue risks for the organization. It's an offense to actually not create these records uh, and to not maintain them for the period of two years and it's an offense to not provide them to the Commissioner. So I hope this has been uh, a, a useful, informative, instructive overview about Canadian privacy law. As I said, it was mainly intended for an audience of uh, privacy lawyers who practice outside of Canada to get a sense of, of what is the lay of the land in Canada, how Canadian privacy laws are structured, what its general principles are, what the requirements are, how it's enforced by our Privacy Commissioner of Canada, when you can end up in the courts in connection with a, a PIPEDA issue. Uh, and to provide general information about the data breach notification requirements in Canada. Anyways, thank you very much for tuning in, uh, and if you have any questions uh, or any comments, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, I read them all and I reply when I can, uh, and feel free to follow me on Twitter at Privacy Lawyer. Thanks again.